All right, we can start sharing. Um, so hello everyone, my name is Yuhan. So I previously worked for the Shanshui Conservation Center and helped to set up the Snow Leopard Tourism Program there uh, with Terry. So this section, we're going to discuss the principles for community involvement in the Snow Leopard Tourism. So here is the outline for a couple of principles that are provided by the resource person uh, based on our previous experience. Of course, we're looking forward to hearing more suggestions from all of you today on how to better engage the community. Um, so we have concluded six principles. So we will start by uh, looking at the suitability or preconditions of developing snow leopard tourism, and then discuss the tension between individual uh, interests and also community interest. Um, then we move on to community governance and see how we can engage them and respect the structures and also some specific management details. And the fourth principle will be about the collaboration with broader players and especially with the powerful ones or the local government. And then Bexad uh, will lead us to look at how to engage this type of um, tourism in a larger scale. And then Ajay will bring us back to our theme of conservation. Um, so we will start with Terry um, about the suitability and also the tension. Great. Um, thank you, Yuhan, and hello, everyone. Um, I think we're really lucky today that we've got Yuhan and uh, Jirchu with us, who both have a wonderful experience on the ground of running um, a conservation community-based tourism project. Um, so they're going to talk in some detail a bit later about some of the real experiences and community challenges, community management and so on. Um, but before we get into that, I wanted to, to really give some perspectives sort of from, a, from somebody who was involved um, in setting up the project and uh, sort of reflections after having seen it run for, for a little while. And really to look at the, the conditions. So what are the conditions, the preconditions that sort of make for a successful conservation tourism project? And I think from, from my mind, there are three uh, main uh, preconditions. One, of course, it may seem obvious, but uh, the presence of snow leopards um, and other sought after wildlife and also the, the chance of seeing them. So, you know, this is sort of a prerequisite if you're going to set up a tourism project is that tourists want to come uh, because there's something to see. So very obvious, but it's worth, worth saying. And then the second one is effective community structures to manage the tourism uh, and deal with issues. So, you know, no matter how well uh, a project is planned, there will be issues that come up. You know, some of them might be foreseeable, some of them won't be foreseeable. And so the community needs to have an effective way to deal with uh, those issues as they come up and to manage the project as a whole in terms of things like collecting money, um, you know, developing uh, codes of conduct and things like that. And then the third one is perhaps less obvious, but um, comes out as soon as you have issues to deal with and where there are decisions taken within the community, the power to enforce them where there are disagreements. So, you know, whether that is the local government, which of course in China, you know, the government is all powerful and uh, is vital uh, in terms of, of doing any sort of project like this on the ground. So in China, certainly it would be the local government. But in other places, other countries, it may not be. It may be other um, stakeholders. It could be uh, local authorities. It could be uh, religious leaders or, or community leaders, whoever it might be that is respected and has the authority. Um, it, it's important to have their support too, so that when those issues come up and there are disagreements, they can be enforced. Um, so that, they're sort of the three things that, that um, stand out for me Having, having worked um, in Angsai. And then the, there's a big tension, what we call a tension um, that will come up uh, whenever uh, a project like this is developed. 
And the tension is always between prioritizing the tourist experience or the community uh, cohesion. And I think we're going to come at this from you know, being conservationists and people who work in, in snow leopard conservation and related areas. You know, I think the answer to this uh, is probably going to be quite obvious, but I think that um, you will be challenged and it's important to sort of understand the perspectives of both uh, sides and those people who may have a different perspective to the conservationists or to the people who are um, supporting the community in order to understand the, their perspective and to see why um, it's organized in a certain way. So to be able to defend the way that it's organized. So just to sort of start a discussion, um, I wanted to just raise a few points here um, and then I'd like to, to go into a whiteboard where we can get contributions from others so that we can just get to a sort of shared understanding um, of, the, of this issue. So from a tourist perspective, you know, often tourists who want to come and see snow leopards are coming from a long way. They may only have a week's holiday, you know, every year, and they may really, really want to see a snow leopard. Um, so they want to stay in the best possible location, you know, where they have the best chance of seeing a, a snow leopard. So if you have a homestay style approach, which is the situation in Angsai where the homes, you know, they're all obviously not right close together, they're spread out over a vast area. And of course, some areas are better than others in terms of having the chances of seeing snow leopard. So tourists will want to stay at the best location to give them the best chance. They'd also probably want to um, choose which family they stay with because they may have heard on the grapevine that family X has a great guide and lovely conditions, whereas family Y, you know, is pretty useless and uh, the beds are cold and, you know, there's no, the food's bad or whatever. So tourists may well want to choose which family they stay with. Um, and of course, this kind of methodology, uh, the argument in favour would be that, you know, this favours, encourages good guiding, encourages good um, uh, accommodation. People will invest because they're sort of competing. Uh, and so the best guides will get rewarded, the best host families will get greater rewards. And the idea would be that competition encourages improvement, aspiration and so on. But of course, this approach prioritises customer experience over community cohesion. So on the other side of the coin, you know, in terms of the community, uh, prioritizing the community, um, there are some impacts on, or potential impacts on the tourist experience. So where, you know, in a community situation, such as Ang Sai, um, a key thread throughout the whole project has been that the benefits are shared uh, equitably across the community. So this sort of recognizes the principle um, that pe some people said in the last session, you know, about how these, these resources are shared, these, this wildlife, these, these natural places are shared by the community, that some tech cases they actually have land ownership rights, but in other, in other senses, it's more of a, a sort of moral, uh, you know, people are coming to our backyard and they're exploiting our backyard. And so we should all um, take some of the, the benefit from that. Um, and of course, regardless of ability and location, equal chance for families to benefit. So in Angsai, they have a very strict rotation system. So each family gets an opportunity to host an equal opportunity and they draw lots to see who's going to be the first family for each round. And so you know where you are on the list. And the tourists that come, you get the next family on the list and you don't get any choice in that. Um, and that's obviously very good for for community cohesion and for benefits to be shared equitably. Um, and then obviously also another benefit of the community focused approach is that the revenue can be used where it's most needed in the community. So for example, to tackle poverty or issues, to pay health insurance or, or whatever it might be. But there's a, there's a sense of community about where that revenue uh, is spent. So that approach prioritizes community cohesion over uh, the customer experience. So there are just a few points that I wanted to get 
to, to sort of say to kick off this discussion. And I think what I'd like to do now is have a whiteboard to say what are the pros and cons for uh, either type of approach. And I think what I'd love to hear also is you know, it doesn't have to be either or. There could be some really clever ways to, to manage both. And I think you know, that's something to think about as well. Um, but I think for now, let's look at the pros and cons for these approaches. So maybe if we can go to the whiteboard, um, we can look at pros and cons of a tourist focused approach, uh, first of all. Terry, do you want to do your poll first? You had a poll ready. No, I want to do the whiteboard first. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> and then we do no worries. <laughs> do I need to stop sharing yet? Okay. Yeah, Christoph's got it for the whiteboard. You already have some comments coming in uh, the chat, Terry. Sorry, Justin, I got kicked out by uh, by Zoom. We were testing its limits, technological limits. So give me a second. I'm just getting back. <laughs> no worries. I see Terry uh, from uh, Vushal. You've got a comment about uh, the trip advisor approach you suggested. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is a very, you know, sort of going down that road is a very market based approach, you know, and I think it goes against you know, what we discussed in the first session. And I think it goes against what people would would um, suggest here today as well. Um, but I think it's important to air these issues so that we all have a sort of shared understanding of of why, you know, we, we tend to do things a certain way rather than another way. And I think that's really important to be able to defend when you're challenged, because you will be challenged. You know, tour operators will challenge some tourists will challenge um, and so it's helpful to know to sort of have this sort of shared understanding and be able to be armed you know with, with a case as to why why you do it a certain way okay so, so pros so, and cons of the of the um Terry, would you like me to put a um put up like a uh, table on left we go with pros right we go with cons or let's go with Pros first and then cons. Yeah, I think maybe left and right. I th yeah, would be good. Yeah, have sort of two columns. Would be great. So if we do the tourism approach, tourist focused approach first, you know, the pros of that, obviously, tourists will generally get a better experience. So the project may get a better reputation from tourists. Um, yeah just to start off. Okay. So Terry and Aung Tsai, I think we've heard stories from Johan and Jurchu about um, th there's one guide who is really good um, and he always uh, is manages to get sightings of snow leopards um, and everyone just wants to go with him. And he's just really good. He's just really good at ensuring snow leopards are sighted and, and a good sighting. And yeah, so, and while other families, maybe you have zero chances of getting a snow leopard sighting. So I guess, yeah, it's related to that. Um, might be skills uh, are, are not distributed equally within the community, recognizing that. Absolutely, yeah. You know, a lot of it's about location as well. So, you know, where families are based, um, obviously some are better than others, some positions. And so, you know, that offers, that increases the chances too. So. Okay, so we're getting a couple of things now. So first of all, uh, Vrushal, yeah, I don't think this TripAdvisor approach is the wisest yet. Um, a bit like the crop raiding problem. Unless everybody does similar things, there will be problems. Yeah, so I think there's a you know one of the cons of this obviously is a risk to um, community cohesion, uh, inequality of benefits, and so on. Uh, Moe's snow leopard sighting may not be used as the only USP, rather promoting all the natural, biological, and cultural features. Yeah, I mean that's certainly true. I think um, from my experience in Angsai, a lot of the foreign visitors that come in particular, they say that actually the highlight of their trip is the cultural experience, the, the very authentic 
experience of staying with a, a Tibetan uh, family and seeing their their genuine way of life, you know, with the yak herding, um, the making the yogurt, uh, milk, milking the yaks every morning, taking the yak out to pasture and things like that. So that's certainly true. Uh, it's not an easy task to equitably share the benefits in a community. In any case, some will be more involved and get more benefit and some will remain disassociated, even try to create problems. So what to do about that? Yeah, so I think you know this is a point about um, the community. How how to how does the community arrange the equitable sharing of benefits? You know, the community has to be able to have a structure that enables that to happen, and to be able to deal with issues and problems. So I think a tourist focused approach potentially undermines that. Um, yeah, we, we definitely wouldn't get an equitable sharing benefits. Pros, number of tourists will be higher. Yep. So if you if you have a tourist focused approach, you will generally get more tourists, um, which might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing. So you know it obviously depends on on numbers and, and the carrying capacity of of the area, but potentially revenue could be higher if you get more tourists. And another pro, yeah, creating competition, which leads to service enhancement. Yeah, so if families that are perhaps not as good initially see that families are doing better because they put invest in, in their guiding skills and, uh, and maybe sort of before families come, tourists come, they get intelligence on, on where the animals are. You know, those that put in more effort get more reward. So maybe that raises the standard of of everyone that could be a pro of that approach um, if we break down the tourists into who they are it brings a different perspective as far as i've noticed the majority of photographers and they're only looking at getting a picture of snow leopard which gets them the maximum likes and follows on instagram and facebook yeah <laughs> yeah i think that's very true i think um, it's the photographers that tend to be more demanding uh, and put pressure on the community and individual guides, you know, to deliver because they have, that's their, you know, number one goal. Um, so for photographers, I think, you know, it's they, those pe people that I think would prefer the tourist focused approach because they, they can then choose, you know, where they, stay which guide they stay with and they're more likely to get their uh, photograph that they can get lots of likes on social media high number of tourists can be a con too absolutely <laughs> um yeah so again you know one a tourist focus approach may not take into account uh the carrying capacity of the, so you may end up with lots of people at the same time, um, you know, which could potentially impact on the fragile environment uh, and lead to other problems like you know, competition, direct competition and, uh, between groups and um, potentially things like litter as well. So num number of tourists may not be controlled in a tourist focused uh, approach. Yeah, you hands point. I think we've got that one. Tourists have a good experience and will build a good reputation. Um, yeah, customer satisfaction. Poor acceptance of local community, which may challenge sustainability. Too large volume of tourism. Yeah, absolutely. I like that point. Good stuff. Ponds. Local communities are not always able to control the activities of tourists on the landscapes. Yeah. So if you're too focused on the tourist experience, you know, there may be uh, negative behaviours that come with that. Absolutely. 
um, another con from Anne Camille on disturbance to wildlife if numbers of tourists are too high and, and trips occur too often in the same area. Absolutely. So again, this is to do, you know, to do with numbers of tourists. Um, and I think certainly from the experience of, of Angsai, you know, they have a strict limit, um, which is probably well below what the, the area could carry. But I think it's right to be cautious and, and have limits on numbers so at any one time. You know, and then you then important to monitor that impact. So before you increase, um, you be very careful about that. So you need to make sure that, that numbers are not having a negative effect on on fragile environments. Uh, pros, high profit and income generation. Yeah, so that's certainly true. If you get more tourists, higher income. Yeah, that's already there. Human wildlife conflict might increase. That's an interesting one. Um, I mean, certainly, I think with a with a tourist focused approach, you potentially encourage bad behaviours because, you know, if you're really really um, focused on getting this group of tourists a good result, there could be a temptation towards things like baiting, um, you know, and the tourists may encourage the local guides to do that if they really want to get the result and so having too much focus on the tourism experience may uh, lead to to those kind of behaviors demand of fuel wood and local food supplies will increase yep yeah. yep yeah. so again this is about sort of carrying capacity and the resource implications and environmental implications um, income generation, yeah, yeah. Overall projection of value with respect to conservation, yeah. So the sort of profile and reputation maybe increase if we get more visitors. Cons, habitat degradation, yeah, great. Well, we're getting a lot of points here, um, which is good. Um, but I don't want to take up too much time on this. So um, maybe we can uh, just check, see if there's anything new. Some of the points are sort of are similar to others. Pollution, yeah. Um, competition will cause service price reduction, less income, demotivation. Yeah, that's possible. <laughs> Tourists may demand facilities. Yeah, absolutely which may be inappropriate. Yeah, and pros, better infrastructure for local communities. Yeah, of course, you know, that's, um, I know there's been some debate in, in Angsai about having mobile phone masks, for example. You know, the local community really wants it because it gives them that connection to the outside world. Um, and so, you know, is it right for people to say, no, you can't have that? Just because you don't want it to be too developed. You know, do, and the same with the roads. Okay, so let's let's maybe um, switch to the the community focused approach and look at the the pros and cons of that. Just give me a second, please. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Terry, there's there's another uh, point. I was just wondering if you could have a look at it, which is uh, um, where did that go? Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> okay, I think we've got most of the most of the key points there. Um, yes, please. Okay, I'm just going to clear this one, and then we can go to the the next one, please. Can you remind us, Terry, what the next question is? Well, we just want to look at the, at the um, better pros and cons of the community focused approach. And this is assuming um, 
not just individuals in the community benefit, but the entire benef uh, community benefits or more there they decide. So not assuming that. Yeah, I think, I mean, if, if we look at the Angsai example where, you know, the community has an approach where there's a strict rotation of host families, um, you've got uh, all of the money, the revenue staying in the community and uh, they decide how that money is split so you know how much goes to the family that hosts directly how much goes into a community fund and how that money is spent um, so that all of the community benefits um, yeah and more strictly regulated you know in terms of numbers in terms of um, group size things like that So much less focused on, you know, the community, the, uh, the tourism, uh, the tourist experience. So, everyone's much more focused on tourist benefits. <laughs> In the comments, <laughs> that's what it seems. We've got one, um, there's a good one from Yash there. Yeah, greater chance of the program sustenance over a long period. Yes, absolutely. So more sustainability, I think, is uh, that's a good point for the community focused approach. You know, they are likely to take a uh, an approach that it does not damage the environment. They're likely to take an approach that um, has less impact. Um, and so more sustainability is likely to be much more at the center if it's a community focused approach. Yeah, and Camille looking at so community focused approach pros, direct involvement of the local community in tourism activities, management and the benefits it can provide the community. Yeah, I think that's a good point about management because you know, empowering local communities is is really important, I think, uh, giving them the opportunity to manage and to decide between them how to how to manage the detail of that, I think. So this empowerment um, is a good point. Yeah, Joanna's point about basically the reverse, <laughs> the opposite of the first one. Less friction between the community. Yes, absolutely. So I think Ismail's point is very good. Um, you know, instead of having one or two good guides that get all the business, um, you know, which can create division and break down social cohesion, you know, a community focused approach, there's much like much less risk of that happening uh, as everyone benefits. Yeah. The con from Yuhan. Um, the community may prioritize equity over project quality. Yes, so you know, you, again, you, you do sacrifice some element of uh, efficiency or the tourist experience by uh, having this community focused approach. Pro conservation can be kept as a priority above tourism, absolutely, so you can control that much more easily with a, with a community focused approach um, so that conservation is the is the overriding objective rather than tourism in itself encourage entire community into conservation action as a unit yeah and i think this is um a good point as well i think it creates shared a shared understanding and a shared vision um for for the place and shared appreciation of uh, the wildlife and the environments. Lower impact of tourism, yeah. Better profit from a lower number of tourists, yeah. I mean, you could, but that's possible. You could, um, you know, have it low volume and high high cost for people. So you make it uh, more exclusive. better engagement among 
passive members of the community yet. And I think you have an opportunity to involve more people and give roles uh, to different people, depending on what they're interested in and their skills, their experience and so on. Con, community may incline more towards conservation tourism activities, losing focus on other conservation activities. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, a risk that the community moves or prioritizes tourism over, over conservation. Uh, sharing of knowledge, passing that down to the next generation is a pro, yeah. Con, local communities' interest on money can become higher than their interest in conservation, yeah. Pros, easier to create a community fund, yeah. Coupon. Benefits can go to young too, not necessarily involved. For example, money for all students. Yeah. So I think that's the point about the revenue being used in a in a way that the community decides is best. So you know that may be towards paying for health fees for elderly people, for example, where they need it. Um, it could be to support young people having education. Um, so there's much more flexibility for the community to decide that in, in a community focused approach. I think is great. So we're getting a lot more pros and cons on this one, <laughs> which is what I'd expect, which is good. Cons, shutting out of new ideas and practices. Bruchal, maybe I can just ask you to expand on that a bit. So I'm, I'm not sure what you mean on that. Shutting out new ideas. Bruchal, are you there? Oh, yes, Terry, thanks. I'm um, responding in the chat, but I can say here. Yeah. Yeah, just that point on uh, about shutting out newer ideas and practices. Yes, ideas could be to um, manage the tourism initiatives better. One has to probably uh, try and incorporate uh, newer ideas from other areas or you know what's new in, in the tourism sector. And practices could be to uh, better govern the conservation areas, um, you know, taking into consideration maybe scientists, government authorities, uh, tourists themselves, etc. Okay, and so some, sometimes hit a plateau. Yeah. Okay. So in a, they can get set in their ways, if you like, and not be open to, to those new ideas. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Terry. Great. Thank you. You have not every community has the ability to develop fair and sustainable projects. Some have serious corruption problems. Yeah, that's true. And not only corruption, Terry also skills in managing finance uh, in some cases. Maybe they need to be supported. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Right, the conservation action decision can be made more easily involves communities. Yes, that's true. Yeah, and, and Baya Jagal, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, the con usually a lack of same point, usually a lack of skills and capacity to run tourism by local communities. Yes, they may need um, help and, and support capacity building initiatives. Whereas if it was more tourism focused, that might come through the market through. Um, through individuals and so on. Risk of groups forming within the community. Yeah, so you could get little power bases springing up, try to get greater share. Yeah. Encouraging ideas through community discussion. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's certainly a good point that I think when 
in a community focused approach you know when issues do come up um, the community you know has a structure to deal with that and to discuss those issues if it's a community focused system and so you get the input from you know a whole range of people and a range of ages and, and experience and wisdom and so on so and that's helpful i think if you had a tourist focused approach you may not you may not get that not improving so it's, okay we're getting lots and lots of points this is great yeah certainly um a lot more pros and cons on the community side which is fantastic so i think i think um let's i, I don't want to um hog too much of the time because we've got some really really rich content coming from uh Yuhan and just you uh, about the anxiety project so maybe we can um draw a line on under this now and then you know, having had this discussion which i think is helpful to get out some of these issues um and uh and look at the, the pros and cons of, of two different approaches you know we can perhaps go to the the poll yeah. i like that <laughs> so i'm starting the poll now do you, you can read it out uh, am i okay to take it out sure so based on the discussion that, that we've had now over the last um, quarter of an hour or so, uh, which approach do you think is more suitable for conservation tourism? So prioritizing the tourists or prioritizing the community cohesion? I think I know which way this is going to come out. Kustub says, that's one of the easiest questions ever asked. <laughs> <laughs> well, not everyone, not everyone is on the, in the same boat, so. But it's easier said than done, right? I Absolutely. think that's, that's what these discussions highlighted. Yeah, um, I think the point, the point is that however um, the project is set up, you know, it will be challenged. There will be people who have a different view, um, even within the community, you know, that may have a different view. And I think you know it's important to understand that perspective, uh, and also to be able to, you know, defend the way that that it has been set up. So you know, I think I think this is a really, for example, if if we'd had this discussion and had all these points before um, we set up the project in Angusai, I think it would have made it a bit easier because we could have sort of uh, foreseen some of the issues maybe and and uh, helped to. To sort of deal with them before they became bigger. Um, okay, so I think we've had about. Yeah, I'll end the poll, I think, and yeah. share the results. We have 25 have voted. We have two that have prioritized tourists, uh, Terry. Yeah. Yeah, great. And 18 who prioritize community cohesion. So that's pretty good. 90% in favour of community cohesion. That's pretty much what I'd have expected to come out with this group, because I think, you know, we're all that way inclined, we're conservation minded people. Um, so that's pretty much what I'd expect. Yeah, I'd be interested for the two who, who voted for the tourist experience. Um, obviously, they don't have to reveal themselves, but it might be interesting to hear why they've uh, gone for that. So if, if any of those two Want, uh, want to put their head above the parapet and explain why they voted that way. That would be really informative, I think, really instructive. So we'll give them an opportunity <laughs> before we move on. Uh, this is a chance I voted for the tourist experiences. Uh, it's not, not just because simply choosing tourists or community, uh, but why not choose this? Because I think before the tourists come to the community, uh, to the rural landscape, the mountain landscape for the snow leopards. Um, I would give them the standard first to let them know what should do, uh, what shouldn't do in there. Uh, this is a basic requirements, which uh, will make sure keep the safety for the, uh, for the environment, for the wildlife and for the local communities. And uh, so they, they know this is a red line. We cannot beyond beyond this beyond uh, beyond this. So, uh, but um, 
So, so, so this is uh, how I keep the benefit of the community and uh, uh, the other sides because the tourist is a uh, how to say uh, call milk 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 call. So this is a source of the wh why we do this because we want to use to do a environmental friendly business to benefit the local communities and also wildlife using the uh, resources from outside the world, uh, uh, beyond the villages, the remote villages. So, so I, I think the the standards for the client's experiences is, is really important. Of course, we will educate our clients to let them know uh, to make the community satisfied and uh, wildlife uh, eco friendly. Is also is kind of a, how to say, outcome of your adventure tour. So they will understand why we do this and they will keep this in their mind. So that's why I choose the tourist experiences first. Thank you. I think that's very helpful. And I think Yash's comment actually is, is really helpful as well. Cause I think it doesn't have to be uh, you know, either or. We've sort of polarized this, uh, in, this in this discussion to illustrate uh, the pros and cons, but I think actually there is a potential to try to uh, do both as far as possible, uh, you know, and come to an accommodation that suits the the local community. And I think we'll we'll hear a little bit more about that later on the Angsar experience about ways that the community has attempted um, to to move more towards the tourist experience, but without compromising on the uh, community cohesion. So. I think you know, we've polarized it here just to illustrate the point, but I think actually Yash's point is, is spot on. You know, there are ways, or there can be ways to bring both together, uh, you know, depending on the circumstances and uh, you know, be with a bit of creativity um, and flexibility. So anyway, uh, let's move on for, from this for now, but thank you so much to everyone for, for their participation in that and all the, um, points that were made in the discussion. I thought that was really, really helpful and enlightening. And there's certainly a lot of points there that, that I hadn't thought of before. So, so thank you so much. Um, and I think we hand back to you, Hannah. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Um, I think the discussion regarding tourist experience and also community cohesion is very important, which lays the foundation for the following sections. Um, so now we will take a closer look at the on-site example and also add a community engagement. So can we have the slide with all of the photos of Ansai? Yeah, next one. Ah, yeah. Um, so here are a couple of photos about the area we are talking about. Uh, previous one, yeah. And the place is called Ansai. So it is located at the headwater of the Maple River. If we look at the green star, um, it is somewhere around here. And this area is home to more than 30 snow leopards and also uh, with many other wildlife such as common leopards. Um, so families living here are living their traditional way of life and each family may have up to like 40 yaks and they move around according to seasons. And also this area has a quite long uh, history of participating in conservation actions. So if we look at the photo um, in, in the middle, so this is one of the local person uh, taking care of a camera trap. So here we want to start with thinking about how to design a host family based snow leopard tourism project in this place. Um, and we can have the pool right now. I launched it. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Justin. Um, so if we look at this poll, it gives some basic information of this area, just as what I have described just now. And try to think about like, how are we going to select host families in this area? Um, though like in the previous discussion, we did mention that it would be great if uh, the whole community can participate and involve in this type, this type of tourism. Uh, but the reality is uh, when we start a project, probably only a very few families, um, probably around 15, 20 
or something like that can become the first um, group of host families. So we have to make the decision. Um, so here are the three options. Um, of course, in reality, we may mix them together, but now we just focus on them individually. So the first option is about NGOs and conservationists. Uh, they can select the host families who have actively, actively participated in the conservation activities. Those people, they believe, who have the best knowledge about wildlife and also who have been very actively uh, active in the previous ac um, conservation activities. And the second option we provide here is the community selects the host families based on their own criteria. It can be related to conservation or it can be something else. And the third option here is um, quite similar to what we have discussed previously. It's more like a trip, trip advisor approach where uh, tourists and travel companies can select the families based on the review from the pilot trips or previous trips. So we can take probably another 20 seconds and think about like if you are going to develop this project in Ansai, how are you going to select the host families? All right, I think we can stop here and show the result. Mm. Results are shared here, <laughs> mixed response. <laughs> yeah, I guess after Terry's uh, section of discussing about like tourists and also community uh, interest, uh, it's quite obvious that uh, we feel like conservation and community are two very important elements. Um, so it's not surprising to see that we have voted for uh, NGOs and conservationists as well as the community selects the host families itself. Uh, of course, there is no um, right option and each option can be possible. Um, so here we are going to look at like how on site this community actually selected their host family as an example. So we can go to the next slide. Next slide, Terry. Yeah, it should be. Yeah, this one. Um, so in the case of Ansai, um, the community selects the host family. Um, even if the NGO, the conservationist Shen Shui, uh, provided some ideas about this project, but um, they didn't participate into the family selection because the NGO does, didn't want to intervene um, the community structures. So if we look at this slide, um, I list out three points. Uh, and based on these criteria, that the on-site community select the host families. Uh, so the first point, and also I think it's the most important point, is about internal um, equilibrium. Um, so if we think about this community, it has three villages, and under each village, they have subgroups. So when the community decided to select the families, they have a number of 15 and or maybe 20. So the first thing they have in mind is, okay, how many family we will have from each family and from each group so that after, so that they can keep this uh, balance within the community because uh, host family also means income for a specific village or group. So this is uh, one of the most important criteria they have. And then the second criteria is about location. Um, so the community decides location is, is important and the location we're talking about here is not about the location of seeing snow leopard because uh, the community believes that um, each family, uh, snow leopards are everywhere. So uh, each family will be able to take the guest to see the snow leopard. Um, so the location they are using, uh, if we look at the map on the right, so the blue line is the Mekong River. So for the first 15 families, the first group of host families, all of the families are along the river by the road. 
because the family thinks in the beginning of the project, the accessibility is very important. And also many of these families have 4G internet network, which is also a, a, a good point of having tourists. So that's the uh, second criteria they have when selecting the first group of uh, host families. And then the project is getting larger and they're expanding from 15 families to more than 20 families. And how to include uh, the new families. So the second, the third criteria they have for including the new families are mostly around popular trust. Uh, because the tourism project is still a new project. So the community wants to select the families who can represent the community as a whole and who has the ability and willingness uh, willingness to host the tour as well. So this is what they discuss as the popular trust. So these families are either uh, community leaders or um, those people who have previously participated in conservation actions. So we can see like at different stage of this project, the community is using different criteria for family selection. But of course, it's not a very easy process because there have been lots of debates of how many uh, families each village should have and which family they are going to select. Uh, but after these um, debates or discussion, so finally they select the families. Um, so the advantages of this type of uh, family selection from the community is that the community have a sense of ownership of this project. And also they have the best knowledge um, to know which family might be suitable to host this type of uh, tourism project. So some of the families selected that uh, as someone from, uh, from the NGO I have never uh, in contact with, uh, but they turned out to be a really, really good host family. So as part of the NGO, I may only have a partial knowledge of who can host the tourist, uh, but the community probably didn't know more about that. And another benefit of this type of uh, family selection is that since the tourism is not the only project that going on in the area, they can always balance the income and opportunities by giving other projects to other families. So it's not always the, the one or two families that benefit from all of the income. So they can balance, okay, you take the tourism pro project where well, I can take other projects and in the end we all make some money. Um, so from the reviews of a tourist, we found out that some of them or most of them really enjoy uh, staying with the host families because the culture here is very, very unique. And also this type of tourism uh, have established a sense of pride within the local community because previously they're thinking about, okay, the outside world is the best place. But then they realize that, okay, people are now coming to my place to visit my hometown. They start to realize the uniqueness and the beauty of their hometown, which is, is very valuable. Um, so now I think we're moving to uh, more uh, specific management points of this project and Jitsu will give us uh, her presentation. Okay, hello everyone. I'm Jitsu from Shenshui. Now I'm working in Ansai Valley uh, nearby the origin of Mekong River. Uh, I will elaborate this issue by answering a few questions, uh, basically by a timeline of how we did actually uh, to try to make it clear. Uh, speaking of community management, uh, the first question is who should participate in what way and why? Since we know that for conservation, it's very important to understand that snow leopard and other wildlife rely on the pastures belonging to all villagers. Uh, just like uh, what RJ said before, uh, the same for tourism. It's important to let the whole community uh, know that they own a share of the project because the nature resources belonging to them are being used uh, during the whole tourism. So they have the right to gain and also the responsibility of helping it run successfully they can do things like uh, supervising outsiders not to enter the valley or share uh, information and 
local uh, location of the uh, wildlife to other host families. And so uh, in this case, I think uh, the whole community should be get involved. The second question is uh, for the practitioners, um, namely host families, who is to receive uh, visitors and when? In Ansai, it's a matter of uh, efficiency and fairness within and between uh, host families and visitors. We have to balance the two things. When we first started Nature Watch, uh, there, come, uh, there came problems about the order. Uh, at first, order of the host family uh, is fixed by their joining time. Uh, soon we found maybe uh, there are always some better seasons and worse seasons in the whole year. And uh, the families might be fixed in certain time, uh, which apparently not fair to them. So they draw straws to have a random order of a rotation system. Uh, now we do, do it at the beginning of every year. Uh, it's fair to every host family. Then another problem came. Uh, visitors cannot choose ideal host family. They may pay the same money, but the rotation system doesn't guarantee the same good experience. Uh, on the other hand, few super guides with outstanding abilities, they may not get more payback than others equally. So after discussion of the uh, in, inside the community, a uh, second guide was put into use which means beside the original guide, visitors can pay extra money to hire a second guide. Uh, then the second guide is allowed to own all of the money, fear for uh, visitors to have good experience, hopefully, and also efficient for uh, super guides to be appreciated. And then the third question is, uh, once the project started to run and uh, have an income, who will get the revenue and how? Uh, I think to know the distribution, we have to know the investment, like what was said before. Uh, actually, all the villagers have already bought their shares through uh, their pastures with flora and fauna on it. Uh, besides, host family bought their shares through their labor. Uh, finally, the distribution uh, consists of three parts uh, by portion of 45, 45, and 10. Uh, 145 uh, is for the host family, and uh, the other 45 as public fund for the good of the whole community. And the 10 is for conservation to protect the pastures and wildlife. Uh, till now in Ansai, the public part of the money is used for poor relief. The most part goes to the poorest and the rest goes to every village. And the conservation fund has not been used yet. I think the, the, in this question, the third part, uh, transparency is very important. Uh, it's necessary at the very beginning of the project that the whole community uh, should come to an agreement uh, uh, on how to distribute the income and understand why. Uh, later, it's also very important to make a public announcement about how the money actually be used. And after all those detailed problems, uh, the last question is, uh, who should take the responsibility to solve the problems? Okay, finally, I think uh, at the best cases, the biggest player of the game must be the community itself because they invest, they benefit, so they should manage. Uh, but at the preliminary stage, uh, there may be a few uh, community elites. Uh, in 2019, four administrator was chosen by election in Ansai project, uh, more rights and affairs were passed to the to this certain group, which made those capable people start to think more about the issues like 
if they need more nature watch products uh, and or how to keep income increase uh, continuously and what about the future of the community uh, or things like that uh, now before every host family meeting the management group will discuss the recent issues and gather some ideas uh, based on their experience and uh, and then uh, recommend to other families um, this kind of uh, management uh, maybe encourage uh, the other families better express their opinions i think an interested example is uh, in the end of the last year the second guide was cancelled because uh, host families every host family thought hiring another guide is disrespectful and harmful to the original guide. Instead, they all promised to help each other to be a more qualified guide. Uh, that means they learn to think consciously from a visitor's perspectives, you know, but in their own way. Uh, so that's all for community management in Ansai's case. Uh, I think uh, in Ansai, we should always bear in mind that community is the main body who really determine if the project can work. Uh, if anyone wants to know more details about Ansai, uh, feel, feel free to contact me after class. Okay, uh, so this is... Uh, All right, thanks, you too. Um, yeah, so in the Ansai experience, uh, we found out that a community is very important. Uh, but apart from community, there are also other very important players. Um, so for example, uh, why we need other players is because sometimes the community cannot decide everything or enforce the solutions. For example, in the case of Ansai, um, the community may not have the power or the ability to set up uh, access control. Um, this will require um, the the help from a higher level of government. So in the Chinese context, uh, the development of this on-site project is in close collaboration with the local government. So this project receives very strong support from the local leader. And also um, this is part of the Chinese Sanjiangyuan National Park. So from the national park itself, it provides many resources, uh, including money, Money is one of the most important thing. Um, if we look at um, the photos on the right, so here are the containers outside of each of the host family because sometimes the hosting condition of the family is not that well. So now the tourists can have the option to live in the container just right next to the uh, host family. And all of these container um, the money for uh, building them and also maintaining them coming from the local government and also the national park. And also the national park the local, and the local government provide training to all of these host families and guys in collaboration with NGOs. So we feel like this, this type of broader players and especially the government in the Chinese context is very important. So apart from the local government, there are also uh, important players such as the NGOs, the one that I previously uh, worked for, because the NGOs can provide a uh, knowledge and also monitoring the whole project to see if there are any like serious problems that is going on. So it's act like a third party, which can uh, look over the impacts and also the benefits. And another uh, important player is that in the development of this project is the volunteers. So because in the beginning, uh, we have uh, invited many volunteers to come and stay in these host families so that they can help each other. So the host family will know like, uh, for example, what type of food um, that the outsiders or the tourists may uh, like to eat. Well, the, the volunteer can help them with probably uh, language skills and also uh, other types of training. And we also invited uh, many experts such as Terry uh, to share about his ex experience of developing this type of project or other projects um, across the world. Um, so community is very important, but here we also um, stress the need to collaborate with broader players. 
So above all is the case study from Ansai, and we conclude a couple of principles about this type of um, tourism project. And now I will give the floor to Bexat to share his very valuable experience. Thanks. I think first, uh, Johan, though, we want to broaden it right out a little bit, but maybe we'll, we'll go to Bedsat first to talk about, we wanted to ask because um, you guys have provided a really nice example of engaging, how to engage communities with this example from, from China and Qinghai. Um, and we were thinking if, I don't know if there are questions on the floor or thoughts on other ways to, to engage and, and, and think of uh, uh, empowering communities, uh, well, uh, thinking about these examples that Johan, Terry, and Churchill um, shared. So I don't know, Bizad, you decide. Do you want to take us forward and then we come back to this question at the end? Um, so I was mostly going to talk about um, the overlap between communities, between tour operators, and between conservation. So depends, you know, if, if um, we want to get some more opinions in and feedback for the previous session, we can, or we can do it at the end. Okay. Then maybe we can open it up to the floor for a bit, if that's okay with that, because then, and then you can take us on that um, ending Absolutely. of a broader landscape. So Kustu, do you mind sharing your screen again? And, and maybe we can ask, um, so uh, I mean, the, sure. the team really shared some really nice example from China and on experiences on how to engage and to ensure that benefits are shared between equitably, how decisions are made, how you know there's a strong structure within the community to deal with any difficulties and how they've built support with the local government. So in other contexts, of course, it may be different. So we want to ask, you know, from these other landscapes, what are some thoughts on other ways you can engage with communities to promote some of these benefits for conservation tourism? So Kusu, maybe on uh, how, yeah, how to engage uh, communities from people's different experiences. And maybe we can ask, for example, uh, Moise, if you have some thoughts from Tajikistan that build on, on what uh, the China team have, have shared. Hello. Hey, go for it. Hey, yeah, yeah. I think uh, what uh, what China is doing and what with the Angsai uh, community is pretty much we have uh, you know we just started with this uh, uh, in Tajikistan we just started uh, uh, involving tourism in conservation uh, specifically uh, the association. Of, uh, uh, in the communities and uncourt uh, specifically, and uh, we have sort of we, we don't have like clear uh, uh, written, let's say, uh, strategy and approach at the moment. But we are following almost the same uh, uh, the same way and approach that the, that uh, the guys in Angsai are doing. So uh, of course. Uh, and it's still going on right now. For example, we, are, we just started working with uh, two communities in uh, Palmyra's to, to set up uh, snow leopard tools over there. And uh, it's pretty much the same. So I, I'm glad I don't have anything to add. Thanks, Moise. No, that's interesting. That's, uh, that's nice for the China team also to hear. Um, that there are, you know, similar uh, similar settings uh, being used across the snow leopard range. Anyone else uh, who have uh, experiences or thoughts on other ways to to engage uh, communities with conservation tourism? I see there is Moise. Um, in the uh, and there's yeah I don't know if Moise or Aftab you guys want to to share I see Aftab has written in the chat start a dialogue with the community about the potential of conservation tourism in the area and its pros and cons do you want to share more about that uh, Aftab 
yes, I think uh, it's very important to uh, uh, to start a dialogue to begin the process because usually the community uh, uh, live in very remote and far away areas, and they have not had an idea of tourism business, how it operate and how it take place actually. And also, um, um, uh, there's a there's a good reason to educate them about the uh, mass tourism and the conservation tourism, because generally what they know about tourism is the mass tourism, which is more destructive in the mountain areas. So first of all, engaging them and telling them what actually conservation tourism is, is very important. So they could start uh, uh, sharing their knowledge about the pros and cons of uh, uh, the promoting tourism in their areas. So that is very important, I think, aspect to first of all, engage the local community members, male, female, young, elderly, in the dialogue process. So they could start uh, sharing their input, their indigenous knowledge, and they could also learn your perspective, what you know as an expert uh, on the subject. So that is a good point, I think, uh, to engage community in the beginning. I think that's a very key point that, um, yeah, I think draws on Terry's point in the beginning that they did it from the very, from the start, it was about engaging communities and hearing their point of view and how they wanted to structure it in the Ang Sai uh, example. But I think that's a, a great point to remind ourselves. And then Benazir brings this further and she says, suggests that communities should be engaged and also in the research and conservation uh, monitoring efforts. So potentially having them involved in monitoring the program itself and maybe evaluating the program. Benazir, do you want to share a little bit more about this? Some ideas related to this? I mean, that was my whole point. That's all. <laughs> That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> That's a great point because there are a lot of participatory um, uh, evaluating tools out there now um, where you can bring people together to evaluate the program themselves and then and build on that. So I think that's a, that's a good point in, in working with the teams uh, to evaluate um, in a participatory approach. And Moise is adding capacity building for communities in various aspects of conservation tourism. Moise, do you want to share a little bit more about this point? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, basically, my point is that uh, um, I think there are uh, various aspects of uh, conservation tourism that the community should be aware of, and um, we need to build their capacity accordingly, especially uh, managing the tourists uh, or handling the tourists, because I think it's a very fragile uh, aspect or component of this uh, whole uh, tourism activity because they should be learn or they should be they should have the capacity you know to uh, deal with the tourists because tourists come from all over the different places with different uh, behaviors and different attitudes so uh, this is going to this can be a very sensitive uh, aspect that uh, if the uh, the community has been uh, uh, given prior trainings or uh, guidelines on how to deal with the tourists. It, it's vice versa, but basically they are promoting their uh, landscape or their uh, valley or uh, the village. So they need to be, you know, like uh, be polite with the tourists or how to handle the the more uh, kind of, uh, if, you know, aggressive tourist or, you know, uh, the, just not to, uh, hurt or damage the reputation of their uh, tourism site, you see, because again, uh, we are all discussing about the tourist uh, aspect or the tourist approach towards uh, the promotion of the conservation tourism. And again, uh, it goes with the word of mouth because the tourists who go back and they talk about their, their visit or their experience. So I think it's, it's uh, it's a cash 22 uh, kind of thing, but the, the capacity building, handling the uh, tourist, and also uh, to uh, like uh, preserving again the last in the last session, I also I think touched based on this point that they must be um, 
have the capacity to preserve their heritage and culture because all the tourists they are coming of course they are coming the main attraction is snow leopards and again uh, i think i mentioned this point uh, before in the last uh, uh, the presentation that snow leopard sighting should not be the only usp because uh, we have learned that uh, some of the local guides you know they just lure the tourists that oh you know just, let's come with us and just across this mountain you will see the snow leopards and uh, when they go there and they walk like <laughs> for hours and uh, there are no snow leopards they don't find snow leopards because they were they were never there at first place so they said oh they were there just two days back we saw snow leopards here but i think they just ran away or something and you know just to get some financial benefits so you know the monetary thing you know how it goes with the tour guides so i think these kind of uh, the capacity overall capacity building of community is uh, very important like we can discuss many points in this under this uh, heading but um, in short words that the uh, capacity building of communities is very important same as the <laughs> i won't say capacity building but the uh, same as the awareness for the tourist is important but equally the capacity building of the community is also important thank you mrs no there's a great examples um uh and I see that uh, Anne Camille is suggesting also to get some of the tourists involved in the conservation work itself, potentially, or, or as cultural and wildlife guides, which I think is the case in Ang Sai, for example. So they're directly involved as the guides, as playing sometimes the what maybe the tourist industry would play, um, which is, is another way that they could be engaged. Um, and I, I, then Aftad brings a really important point back to, I think, what Yuhan and Jircho really tried to bring home, which was really related to a committee, um, where, but maybe having broad players involved in so that it develops facilities for conservation tourism and developing a tourism management or impact monitoring framework. So getting involved many stakeholders in, in that decision making and, and um, in, in the planning at the management plan. Um, I see, Varshal, um, maybe we'll take uh, that quite, I, if people can respond in the chat, uh, but I uh, related to that question, which relates to um, what does the team think about providing facilities such as water, sanitation, healthcare, and bank amenities for, for the community? Um, so, uh, I mean, the, the China team uh, kind of shared a little bit about it's the community decides, and I think some of the fund was used for that, for probably a poor, for supporting the community because that's what the community decided to do. Um, but others maybe want to comment in the chat related to Virshal's comment. But I see Raghu is back. So Raghu, why don't you come on the mic and, and share your comment? Um, please, please come and share what you wrote in the chat, your thoughts. Hi, uh, Jesse, this is what about what I was talking about community, uh, more than community, is the travel agents needs um, <clears throat> the education because uh, uh, overall um, we're looking at tourism uh, as the driving engine. So the most of the problems related to access tourism or even community looking at the profit as a community that decides that the profit is the way forward, then you have a problem. So I think we need to also engage with or maybe more aggressively with the travel agents or travel community um, as a conservation organization or conservation interest group of people with the travel agents that um, they need to uh, work with us uh, in, in a way that we can promote tourism and, uh, and benefit local communities. Now, that's a great point, and maybe that's a good segue because I think that's what Bizad's going to talk about right now. Um, so maybe we can end this part about engaging communities, but I think it's it's a great primer to start thinking because why we wanted to, to ask this question was also because we say we want to involve communities and communities should be involved, but there isn't always uh, a roadmap on how or ideas of how to do this. So it's nice to collate ideas from across the range on how one might do this and, and think, of course, in the local context, it might vary, um, but then there's actually some practical tools and recommendations um, so that the communities don't just become passive 
kind of participants in the process. They are actually actively involved um, in the conservation, in the tourism activities and decision-making uh, as uh, our team previously shared. But of course, there are other stakeholders involved as Yuhan shared, the government, but also the tourist industry. So Bezad, we are lucky to have today is, is from the tourism industry. Um, so he can share a little bit more about his thoughts on conservation tourism. So go ahead, Bezad, thank you.